welcome to a bonus episode. Uh, I think this is going to be a bonus episode of the Lions Led by Donkeys podcast, clearly a professional outlet that has things scheduled. I'm Joe, and with me today is KD, uh, the, I was going to call you the host, but that's not, that's not accurate. The writer of War Takes. Uh, I'm, I'm the War is, Takes guy. I'm, I'm the yeah, War the guy. I'm here guy. to take all your war. Yeah, uh, uh, please. Uh, as someone sitting in Armenia right now, please, you can have it. Please take it. <laughs> Sorry, we're, we're, we're at capacity. You're going to have to come back another time when we have more room in the war tanks. Uh, you need a war strategic reserve. Uh, just uh, like a big, like one of those big, uh, oil, like what they one use for- war like, grain silos, which yeah, will no exactly. doubt, like, like yeah. a actual grain silo, catch fire if you so much as sneeze next to it and explode. As someone who grew up in a city, that was probably one of the weirdest things that someone uh, I learned, uh, I think it was in basic training or something, when someone was from like you know Nebraska or whatever, like, oh yeah, corn will just explode. I was like, bullshit. That's not how th- corn works. No, I'm with you. And we both like grew up in the Midwest. And I, I, I'm when I learned that grain like corn could just explode in storage and just like, that's not true. It's just food. Food doesn't blow up. Yeah. Uh, I have to say, this episode is very weird for me because it is a normal hour where I am. Um, normally, I record in the morning. Uh, it is like 5 p.m. here, 5.30. I actually get to have a beer while I'm recording. I actually stopped by my corner store to get beer just so I could have a beer while I'm recording because normally I'm recording at 5.30 a.m. <laughs> I, I was going to say, like I, I've, I'm recording with the rare... Uh, has not just woken up and is not five o'clock in the morning, Joe Kasabian. I feel like I got a rare Pokemon card. I know. it's. Uh, I kind of forget what it's like to talk into this mic and not fucking want to go to bed. Um, what, what are you drinking? I'm drinking uh, Kotike Gold. It's a local beer here. I got it for the princely sum of, I believe, 400 drum, which is a dollar. Actually, I think it's slightly ah. less than a dollar <laughs> at the moment. Inflation is kicking the drum's ass. <laughs> was I mean, was the drum doing so good even before you know war it was actually doing okay like it was at least stable like it's not like a lot of people think it's pegged to the ruble or something but it's not um but apologies as, like, to the our, drum then yeah well it's it's doing reasonably well all things considered when you think like one of our largest economic allies is currently imploding the world um you know thanks Putin. Uh, it, it it's doing okay. Um, it's it's doing better than it has been in the last couple months. And but it's it's very weird. We have I can't really go into details because I don't know enough about I don't know enough about economics. But our That's ministry fine. economics is made up. Yeah, it, it truly is. Money is in, is an invention. Um, and and it just make number go up. But yeah, our our ministry of uh, like economics and stuff isn't the most robust ministry on earth. So it's kind of like, you know, how everybody said during like COVID in the United States when people were like, oh, they're just letting things work themselves out. That's literally what every ministry of our government is doing in regards to the in regards to the like the coming recession. They're like, "Ah, I don't buff out. Like we probably don't have to do anything about this. The coming recession that it seems like everyone just decided like, yep, we're we're, not only we going to have it, but maybe we should actually try and force it. Again, economics is economics is made up. It's, 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 you know what? I'm, I, I'm an international relations guy. At least we sort of act like it's all made up and accept that it's made up. Economists will try and convince you it's real when it's made up. Yeah. I mean, as of right now, our, I think our inflation is like 9%, um, but it's been jumping up and down. So I mean, like I get paid in dollars. So uh, it just means every time I go to the store, things are just weird. Like the prices have jumped up uh, like th- between 300 and 500 drum. The important thing is you can get an evening equivalent of a Tonus to record your podcast with. That is correct. I still can't find that ever again. Like ever since I've, that became a thing when I drank it, <laughs> at, I believe like- it was 4 a.m. Uh, I've been looking around the corner stores here to find like I found drinks from the the, the brand. Like it's not to- it's not called Tonus. It's actually uh, Tesla is the brand name. Oh, um, no. Oh, yeah. no. Yeah, unfortunately, my energy drink has bought Twitter and made it more racist. Um, and now it's catching on fire. Yeah, uh, but I, I can't find the the Tesla Tonus drink. What I will keep looking. Um, I, I will open it's the, the, the store. It's like the store from Gremlins. You go back the next day, and it's just it never existed or burned down. 
Yeah, I can find only sugar-free Red Bull for some reason, because whoever is the import-export guy for Red Bull fucking hates my country. He's probably Aziri. Yeah. Oh, God. Um, Now, interestingly, a a podcast that you were on inspired me to write this episode, and I did not actually think you'd be able to come on uh, because our time zones are so different. Uh, Because you're like, oh, you know, I... We were spending all summer trying to figure out what we should talk about, and we were overthinking it because we're massive nerds. That that is very accurate. Um, and you know, I was uh, like, we were th- talking about like series and, and all of this other stuff. And then I listened to the "Well, There's Your Problem" episode where you guys talked about Rhodesia for I think three hours. Uh, yes. Which, if I re- if memory serves me correctly, you had to do that twice. Uh- <laughs> yes, we had to do that twice because the first time we did it. Uh, I think like 30 minutes to an hour. No, yeah, that day was the day that Roe versus Wade got overturned. And we were uh, all yes. also like, no, it was various... my birthday. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, buddy. Uh, yeah. And we were all, and, and, and in tradition of being Joe Kasabian's birthday, we were all in various states of being drunk, distressed, and depressed. Um, so we got through it. And it's I think, also just I, called my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and I think they go back and listen to it and realize, you know what, maybe we should give this another shot. So yeah, we did it twice and both times it was like two and a half hours, but it was absolutely worth it. Love those folks. It was it was still, you know, the first time it actually helped us cope with it being a horrible day. And the second time it was just it was just fun. But I'm I'm glad it, it resulted in some inspiration for you. Yeah, because there was an aside during the whole thing. And by the way, if if you're listening and you don't listen to, well, there's your problem, which one, I don't know why you don't. Liam is normally a co-host on the show. He co-hosts that one. Uh, we're kind of like weird cousins at this point uh, as shows. Uh, I've had every host of that show on my show at separate points. Um, and now you're on the guest hosts. Yeah, yeah. I'm working my way down the fucking uh, the set lists. Um, but during the, the Rhodesia episode, you ended up talking about the Prince of Albania. I believe his name yes. is Lika or Leka Zogu. Uh, yes, Albanians, yes. I apologize. I don't know how to pronounce this name. Um, and I'll, I'll call him Le- Le- Lika? Leka? I think it's Leka. I, 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 I have uh, your guess is as good as mine. I was just looking at Wikipedia to see if there's a pronunciation guide and there is is nothing. So, you know, just 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 go with what sounds natural. Yeah, I'm going he, with he, Leka. He's, he's, he's royalty and he's dead. Who gives a shit? Yeah, yeah. If I've offended the house of Zogu, then I guess I can't go to Albania. Uh, <laughs> but if, if there's one thing that's a constant on this show is that we love up some Albania. Uh, this started as a joke. Um, because we did one episode about Albania forever ago about the Albanian civil war and we became the most listened to podcast in Albania. Uh, <laughs> and we all had to remember. That, yeah. And then after that happened on, well, there's your problem. They all kind of agreed that I was Albanian rather than Armenian. And I think it was Alice that was like, no, he's Armenian, which is hilarious because at the time Liam was my co-host. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's about the time that i i think i think i made this this really bad resolution graphic that i think you pull out once in a while though i just divided the world between greater albania and greater armenia making sure yes. that on the half that was greater albania which i think i made the western hemisphere i put a couple dots in detroit and los angeles that were still greater armenia yeah as things should be um now i was really interested in this uh leka zogu guy because he's if there's one thing I like, a type of guy that I like is mad royalty. Um, I would say a mad monarch, but he never quite made it that far. Um, and But we'll talk about why exactly. Um, and that's because Leka Zogu is possibly the arms trafficking prince turned self-proclaimed king of Albania. Who really <laughs> fucking go. loved Rhodesia. Yeah. Uh, he had a personal army at some point. He had multiple arms caches. He's been he's been arrested probably more than most nobility. Um, because normally when nobility get arrested, it's because they're about to like go on the literal chopping block. Um, but not him. This guy used all nine of his lives if he was a cat. He he did. He 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 took part in a terror attack at one point. He did his own like okay, January sixth in Albania. Yeah, like this God. this guy he has layers like an ogre. Um, I am so I am so ready for this, but it's honestly the story started about him. And uh, to be completely honest, his life story isn't quite long enough. But you can't tell his life story without telling the very weird story of 
Albanian royalty in general, which is, means about his dad, um, who goes by King Zog the first. Um, and I need to point out that, like, I I know the word Zog in a lot of people's minds is very very bad for uh, uh, mostly neo Nazi reasons and conspiracy theory shit. That is not what it means here. I just need to say that now. <laughs> this an unfortunate name is nothing to do with any weird anti Semitic. Oh God, I didn't even make that fears. connection at first until you mentioned <laughs> yeah. that just now, and then I suddenly remembered. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's like the first thing that left to my mind. I was like, oh fuck. I mean, their last their their last name is Zogu or Zagu, uh, but he go like with, when they become king, they go by Zog. I don't well, know. Apparently, why. that was the apparently that was the name he took because apparently last name he was born with was Zagoli. Yeah, which sounds his, like uh, a first draft of Waluigi. <laughs> El, it's it's the Albanian counterfeit version of Waluigi. <laughs> If there's one thing I know about the Caucasus and the Balkans is that like intellectual property rights don't exist. So like there, there there's a, a theme park here that has a Pirates of the Caribbean knockoff, which has like Johnny Depp's face. There's the entire cast face on it, but it just says pirates. I'm going to drop off my kids at the shady daycare with the unlicensed uh, bad paintings of the characters from Cars on the side. Yeah, and it's called like... Uh, Vroom. Vehicles. <laughs> uh, now, Lekka Zogu's dad, uh, King Zog the First, was born Ahmed Mutar Bey Zogoli in Ottoman Albania in October 9th, 1895. Uh, he was born to a Beylik family. Now, Beyliks were something of akin to Turkic nobility and uh, like kind of akin to chieftains, but sometimes given more power. So uh, he was some, some kind of aristocracy. Kind of, yeah. He's, I wouldn't call him like Ottoman aristocracy. He was not that powerful. He was certainly regional. Um, and generations of his family had held that position. And as such, they held quite a bit of regional political power within Ottoman Albania, mostly uh, centralized in the north. Um, in the okay, so this region. guy wasn't a nobody. No, the, he certainly wasn't anything I would call a king or anybody right. that would think of a future king or even a right. future unifier of Albania. <laughs> um, now, to, this uh, family is quite powerful. His mother claims uh, to be a descendant of Skanderberg, who uh, is easily the greatest national hero in Albanian history. Um, really? He's honestly, I, I, Skanderberg? Yeah. Skanderberg, yeah. Uh, I thought so you were I, moment, you swear you were going to say like Norway or Sweden, and then you came in with the Albania and you just floored me. Yeah. Uh, and I do have to point out here, it, this is kind of like when every boring white person claims to be some long lost descendant of some British, Scottish or Irish lord or something. Um, y- you're not. And there's a very good chance that they're not related to Skanderberg either. A ton of uh, regional political people within Albania at the time claimed Skanderberg family ties. It's and like for every good reason. Russian American with Romanov in their name claiming they're related to the Romanovs. Right. And re- and not just some guy who's like literally a shit shoveler for the Romanov serfdom or some shit. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and I mean I don't know. Uh, it's never been proven that they're actually re- related to Skanderberg, but they claimed it. It's a uh, power flex. It's you know like cl- honestly it's like saying you're related to George Washington. Which like is much fl- easier is to prove. Yeah, it's much easier to prove. Though Skanderberg is significantly more badass than George Washington. At some point, I will do uh, probably was a series on him because he's super interesting. Uh, but just know for now, for this, for for our purposes here, very important guy. Um, now this regional very important, uh, very important, very important Skanderberg. Um, it, now there were easy. For Albanians in general, not all Albanians, but for practicing Muslim Albanians, because there are some non-Muslim uh, Albanians, uh, existence within the Ottoman Empire was good. Your experience may vary, I scream from the back of the room. Um, right. They weren't considered Generally Turks. speaking, you're, prob- you're probably going to do better than if you were Greek or Armenian or, you know. Yeah, or any m- religious or ethnic minority, really. Um, and... They weren't considered Turkic, um, but I know some people probably disagree with me on that. Uh, turn my comment section into a Balkan argument. I don't care. Um, Balkan YouTube however, comments, let's go. Yeah, I, fuck, I love that goddamn Twitter account. Uh, okay, uh, so they were, they were Albanians were practicing Muslims. They weren't considered Dimi. They were allowed uh, regional self-rule, a, f- 
a certain amount of freedoms. I won't call them freedoms in general because it is still the Ottoman Empire. Uh, when in comparison, like uh, Christians or um, Assyrians or uh, Yazidis, whatever, uh, they right. were considered dimmy. They were barred from most political power. Though there were some outliers. People always like to point this out to me that some non-Muslim, non-Turkic people rose to power in the Ottoman Empire. That's absolutely true. For example, at one point, an Armenian was the foreign minister for a little while. They're outliers. Yeah. Doesn't happen that often. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's another one of those things where it's like where where people. It was like with here in America with the whole uh, black faces in high places. Like, well, you know, an African American's been appointed the, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, which means racism's gone. Yeah, uh, we had a black president, therefore racism is solved. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, and I love being in a country where racism's been solved. Everything's going super well. Yeah, anyway, let's flick on the news. Um, the N-word was trending on social media the other day. So that's 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 not fun. Um, <laughs> God. I, w- yeah, I woke up to that. I was like, I'm turning my phone off. Um, the N-word and anti-Semitism uh, because, uh, you know what? You know what? Because of let's King Zog. Let's focus on happy things. Let's hope, <laughs> you know what? Fuck you, King Zog. I can't believe you bought Twitter and you, you blew a dog whistle to say racism's okay. Fucking King Zog. I, bl- I blame Kanye. Now, uh, uh, being um, uh, even being a non-Turkic Muslim within the Ottoman Empire fucking sucked. Uh, you were you were still racially considered inferior. You weren't gonna uh, you know make your way in any sublime portes anytime soon. Um, and a lot of these minorities were arguing for independence. Albania amongst them. Albanians began to uh, began to revolt, and this happened more and more frequently as time went on. This ramped up considerably once the Young Turk Revolution happened. The reason for this is, without going into excruciating details, which I tend to do whenever I talk about this, um, the Young Turks and the resulting Committee for Union and Progress, or CUP, or Cup of Shit, uh, were hardline Turkish nationalists. Um, they saw uh, the ability to continue the existence of the Ottoman Empire as a Turkish nation state in the future. They did not see a future for any minorities within the empire. Uh, Hence, all of the genocides. But that also meant people like Albanians who were not Turkish. Um, like th- th- so, they s- before this in the Ottoman Empire, you could have your own language. You could generally keep your own religion as long as you paid extra taxes. You'd go to schools in your your local. Like you wouldn't be forced to learn Turkish or anything like that. It, it um, sounds a lot sort of parallels, like basically when Yugoslavia fell. You know, when when oh god, Slobodan Milosevic took power. It's not like he intended to break up Yugoslavia, but what he wanted to do was basically be like, you know, hey, none of this. You're all you know equals. It's it's Serbs first serve everything and you're all sort of second to us and that's what sort of led to the downfall yeah people tend to get mad at that kind of like when you start like forcing people to give up their their native languages their native customs like people are going to start getting the old boomstick and shooting you in the face uh and that's generally what happened um you know when you're when the the albanian language and customs suddenly got the old thanos finger snap from the local government people started burning shit down uh, yeah, and it's like Ottomans- you said, it's, it's not like uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, you can cut this part out. Sorry, it sounds like I'm jumping over you. I think there's just a slight no, delay. Fine, um, but but like uh, you know, like you said, it's it's not like they were being like super tolerant and super accepting them beforehand. But it was just like they were at least maybe being a little bit more quiet about it. And now it sounds like the quiet part is being said very out loud. Oh yeah, if it's one thing the CUP was good at was being not really hiding who they were, like. <laughs> The like the the minister for the interior once told uh, Henry Morgenthau, who is the uh, the ambassador to the United States uh, to uh, the Ottoman Empire, uh, that he needed to give them uh, the Ottoman government all of the Armenian life insurance policies uh, because they'd already killed them all, and since there's no families left, the money should go to the state. So oh, like, yeah, oh, they God. they were not good. They didn't try to hide shit. <laughs> like they they which told is, which everybody. Is exactly. Given all the genocide <laughs> denial, you know, oh, they, yeah. they don't try to hide any of this shit. But no, that ge- that that one genocide didn't happen. Yeah, say what you will, but if the CUP was still around, they wouldn't deny anything. They'd be very proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, they'd want a, they want they want a participation trophy and everything. Yeah. Now, the Ottomans pretty quickly ceded to Albanian demands, uh, left Albanian schools open, they lowered taxes. Uh, and weirdly, I left this in here because it's the most Balkan shit on earth. Agreed to only draft people from Kosovo for the military. Oh, no. Kosovo just getting the shaft again. 
<laughs> One of those yeah. countries that just yep. – yeah, great. They've had it a little bit better in recent years, but – but just one of those countries that for the longest time just is always getting the shaft no matter what. Yeah, I mean, like, I know we're talking about the Balkans here, so you knew some kind of Balkans-ass shit was coming. But that just jumped out to me that, that, that the Albanians burning everything down and getting mad. And rightfully so, we're like, no, you're conscripting too many of us. You have to only conscript people from our province of Kosovo. They're like, fine, just, deal. Just, Al- 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 Albanians just typing furious. These, like, Albanians should not be draft, only draft Kosovars. Job for yeah. dog people. <laughs> those are not now, my opinions i am just trying to emulate a balkan youtube comment uh the, anyway uh kd is a uh albanian supremacist now uh <laughs> I, I have my entire backyard is just all bunkers it's, it's just every square inch a black eagle tattooed across your chest i mean if you have nothing but bunkers in your backyard you could just be uh <laughs> the guy from austria <laughs> I oh, can't remember no. his fucking name now. Josef Fritzl. Yeah. <laughs> Come into I'll, my basement to do your podcast. Uh, uh, I haven't made a Joseph Fritzl joke in, uh, since the last time I was on a show with uh, Milo Edwards. So, whoops. Now, <laughs> I, I think I think Milo might be solely responsible for educating a large portion of the internet who on who Joseph Fritzl even is, like just we by should, his we, acts We should alone. all thank him for his service. Thank thank you for your service, Milo. Now, while all of this is happening, the Ottomans were getting their teeth kicked in during the Italo-Turkish War, which had been raging on since 1911. And this is this is a war akin to watching the NCAA Division Six T-ball. Uh, it, everybody is just fucking up constantly and the Italians fucked up less. We'll talk about it at some point, I'm sure. Uh, the Ottomans lost the war. They caved to internal unrest and showed the world that, you know, the empire is kind of held together with genocide and duct tape at this point. So if somebody wants to come in and kick them while they're down, they should do so. And so people did so, which was the Balkan League, famously, uh, which was probably most famously known as that one time the Balkans run one side of anything ever. We love a league. Uh, we love a good league, uh, Balkans Fantasy Football League. That that could be a thing. Yeah, Ooh, I don't I'm, know why I'm I drafted said that. Montenegro. Ooh, dark I got horse. a good feeling about Montenegro this this season. I don't know. They're, the numbers are looking good. We're doing the saber metrics on them. I have good feelings about Montenegro. I'm going to go with Northern Macedonia because they're the only country to be bullied so hard by someone else they changed the name of their own airport. <laughs> <laughs> to change the name of their own country because yeah, they, they had to add yeah. the north. But hey, yeah. you know what? To, 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 they added the north and then they got to get into NATO. So, you know, you know, now they're not going to get attacked by anyone. So, I mean, yeah. you know, trade-offs. Actually, I, I fully support uh, Armenia changing the name of our airport if it means us suddenly being able to join the EU. <laughs> <laughs> what would you change it to? Kim Kardashian International Airport? Or? Yeah, why not? Fuck it. Fuck it. Why not? Well, fuck it. I mean, she, put her in charge of it. She can't run it any worse. The loading and unloading zone is dummy thick. <laughs> now, the Balkan League was made up of Greece, Bulgaria, Serbia, and Montenegro, banded together to effectively kick the Ottomans out of Europe in the course of a year. And it would be the biggest disaster that the Ottoman Empire would suffer, at least for a couple years when until World War I happened. Get but, good. Yeah, yeah. It couldn't have happened to a nicer group of assholes. Now, during this, Albania declared independence from the empire, though decided not to get involved in the Balkans War, which is probably a good call because it was horrific. Uh, Albania was officially the Principality of Albania, which is weird because up until now, they had no nobility. And it was headed by a guy named Prince Wilhelm, which, if you're guessing by the name, was not Albanian. <laughs> Wait, okay. Okay, in, 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 in the great, you know, tradition of implanting monarchs from countries that, you know, they're not the monarch of, where did they draft this guy from? He was the second cousin of the German Kaiser. Of course. I mean, I, I suppose, you know what, that's par for the course around there. I mean, you know, Prince Philip, you know, late of the United Kingdom was originally Prince Philip of Denmark and Greece for some reason. Yeah, why not? At least it gets good food out of Greece. I don't know what Denmark has. I assume some kind of spoiled pancakes, fish. I think. I think they have pancakes of some kind. They, they like a pancake with jam. Wooden, I, I, I do know, they eat like, the wooden shoes, or is that the Netherlands? Uh, oh, that, that's that's the Netherlands. Mm, they're the same. Yeah, you, know, you, you <laughs> gotta put on the, you gotta put on the, put on the wooden shoes while we dance around to, to honk ball hoof the class on my radio tonight. 
Look, the only thing that I know about generally Europe as a whole is I recently flew through Brussels uh, uh, in Brussels Airways. Worst airline I have ever been to. I no longer recognize uh, Belgians and independence. Belgium needs to just go away. <laughs> I don't know how a member of the EU has such a terrible airline and is still allowed to fly. <laughs> this, is, this is the point. This is at the point where, where all the Dutch and, and French irredentists who want to divide it up between them are just going, yes, yes. You know what? Good. Go nuts. Um, Nothing good uh, has any- ever come out of Belgium. Except maybe French fries, which, wait, no, those are French. Fuck it. Nothing good has ever Jean-Claude come out of Belgium. Van Damme? Uh, he's Belgian, right? Is he good? Did he do something terrible? He probably did something I terrible. I was about to ask you the same thing. You know what? Let's we'll just, just let's assume just, that he did. We'll just table that and yeah, assume that he did because yeah, it's, it's probably safe for us. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Nate can edit this in when we, when we find out that he did something terrible. We do not uh, support or defend uh, uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme's career in any way uh or his high his, kicks yeah or or his splits his many splits he did splits in between fucking semi trucks one time didn't he i feel like that was jean claude oh, van damme uh, it feels like something he would have done spiritually he would do it if he didn't do it physically um now i don't even know what that fucking means but <laughs> <laughs> uh so prince wilhelm was picked to be the the prince of the principality of albania in the dumbest way possible as you would imagine now albania declared independence and did not originally form itself as a monarchy in any way, as they had no recent history or really any history in the last, I don't know, several hundred years since their time in the Ottoman Empire as a monarchy. Uh, And they were kind of shaping themselves to be some form of republic. However, the Queen of Romania, Elizabeth, heard that the great Western powers wanted to extend their sphere of influence into this newly independent country. And because she really wanted to be involved in all of this and be that bridge that could, you know, bring them all closer, she recommended Wilhelm because she was related to him. Of course. It's the big, the big massive interbreeding web expands further. Exactly. And since this is before World War I, of course they're doing this. Everyone generally thought this was a great idea, other than, weirdly, Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, uh, <laughs> who was re- also related to him, who pointed out, weirdly, correctly, that... Maybe we should pick an Albanian Muslim because they're Albanian and also Muslim. Nobody paid any who attention this, to that. Who is this guy and what did he did with Kaiser Wilhelm? <laughs> yeah, this is that one time where the broken ass clock is correct. Um, like the worst guy you know makes a good point. Ma- the imagine, man who never saw a, a plot that he didn't like. Imagine Kaiser Wilhelm, a man who oversaw two genocides in Africa, looking at Albania like, maybe we should have some Al- uh, Muslim Albanian representation over here. Kaiser Wilhelm getting ready for his uh, his his three minute spot on MSNBC. Oh hell yeah! Oh, instead, I'm pretty sure he retired to no, it was the Netherlands. It doesn't say Belgium, but I'm pretty sure. It was yeah, the he Netherlands. got like sort of. It was the Netherlands. He sort of got exiled there, and and you know, despite everything he did, and despite the Nazis not even liking him that much, I think you know, just died of old age. And, and again, another thing that a dumb person can be very right about, he also didn't like Nazis. Um, so, you know, say what you will about Kaiser Wilhelm exploding the world with a very stupid war. He also didn't like Nazis. So that's, didn't that's like Nazis, one plus. But only because he liked his own sort of, you know, apolitical brand of authoritarianism. Oh, yeah. If the Nazis would have reestablished the monarchy, he'd been a huge fan. Uh, that's, that was oh, yeah, the main absolutely. reason he didn't like them. He didn't give a shit about the anti-Semitism or any of this other shit. I mean, he was an anti-Semite. Uh, but they were like staunchly against the the monarchy returning. So he's like, man, fuck you too. That's all it boiled down to. Why couldn't you guys been more like Italy, which is going to come into play here very soon? Yep. Now, a group of uh, of Albanian old power figures, including members of the Zogu family, told Wilhelm that they would accept him as prince, assuming he would immediately usher Albanian I- Albania into the open arms of Europe, which, of course, that didn't happen. It still hasn't happened. Um, Depending on, I guess, where you're from in Europe. Now, pretty much immediately revolts broke out with people pointing out that we just got rid of the Turks. Why the fuck is some German asshole in charge? Which, you know what? Good point. Uh, the, the Greeks thought this was hilarious and support the opposition. And this turned to a, a three-way as Wilhelm's chief minister accepted a bribe from Italy to form an opposition group to the prince. So it's a four-way I, I now. Would, I've already lost and it's just great. <laughs> So this went from independence to a kind of a four-way civil war. 
uh, all because some German asshole showed up and Italy and Greece thought it was funny. Albania uh, is starting its history of, of, of bizarre civil wars. <laughs> the most Balkan country ever. Oh, and then World War I started. Now, as you can imagine, as a German with deep royal relations with Austria, Hungary, and Germany, tiny uh, you know, half-exploded Albania was immediately pressured to support Daddy Austria and Germany. Somewhat surprisingly, Wilhelm said no, uh, which was mind-blowing to me. However, his entire Seriously, government... Seriously, what did this guy do with the actual Wilhelm? Uh, this is Prince Wilhelm, sorry. Uh, Prince oh, Wilhelm no, of Albania, yeah. Um, okay, sorry. sorry. <laughs> no, also, you're not wrong, because this is the only good decision he made while he was prince. Is like, I don't want to do World War I. Or like, or, mo- okay, so he did personally, but he didn't think Albania should, which is correct. Um, uh, Wilhelm's entire Albanian government was being bankrolled by his fellow inbred monarchs in Europe. And because he told uh, you know, uh, Austria-Hungary and the German Empire to go fuck themselves, they simply cut off his allowance, which meant Albania no longer had an economy. No economy for you, young man, until you join that war. Well, he did. Kind Uh-oh. of. He buckled Uh-oh. down and did the thing that a responsible monarch should do. He abandoned his country and joined the German army under a fake name while still claiming to be prince. Yeah. <laughs> about to say is he just gonna go off and join the german army and he, and, he, and he did because it was the dumbest thing i could think of now weirdly zogu who would eventually become king zog the first also fought in world war one for austria hungary um while albania stayed out of it after the war the victorious allies were absolutely not going to recognize wilhelm's claim to the throne of albania because like fuck the germans and it became a republic with Zogu as its first president with a seven-year term. No, there was no elections. Uh, <laughs> it was kind of like some behind-the-doors uh, you know, meddling type situation. So, smoke-filled rooms and such. Oh, every room back then was full of smoke. Everybody chain-smoked and windows weren't invented yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> windows, windows are a peasant invention. Everybody lived in an <laughs> unventilated cube. The cube was just smoking, you're hotboxing, or just hotbox your cigarettes while staring into the wonder of the cube. That's right. Now, now, unfortunately for, I assume, everybody, the Albanian constitution kind of made their president a dictator. Uh, I'm I'm shocked and appalled. Yeah, it gave him power over all three branches of the government, and he was allowed to appoint everybody, Um, which is a problem. Um, and so, of course, he used this to silence dissent, and he declared himself king of Albania within three years of taking office. Yeah, like when you, when you look at when you look at his dates, like first he was prime minister, then he was president, and then he becomes king, all in the span of like six years, and which is just the the best case of started at the bottom and now we're here. I've ever seen. It's that Napoleon grind said, baby. <laughs> we love he's, we, he's we love Napoleon over first grind said on the show. Yeah, yeah. He first council's like, nah, man. I'm gonna set the new record. I'm gonna break this. <laughs> Bocasa looking on in jealousy. Uh, well, to be fair, this he was king a lot longer than Bocasa was emperor. But uh, this is true. <laughs> he also made himself field marshal of Albania, despite that not being a rank that they've ever had before. Because fuck it, why not? Plus, like uh, Albania though, probably not even having like not enough people, let alone troops, to constitute naming yourself a field marshal of anything. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, though uh, I, I'm not going to shit on this guy the entire time because during World War II, he opened his borders to absorb any and all Jewish refugees. Uh, like, no questions asked. If you were a Jew and you came over the Albanian border, you're welcome. So, well, we like a crazy guy who, you know, has at least a couple redeeming qualities. Yeah, he has, a, he has one. One <laughs> redeeming quality. <laughs> okay, you know what? All you need is one. Yeah. Um, he was also massively paranoid and, and to be fair, this is kind of earned. Albania was something of a tradition of a blood feud, which we've talked about before on the show. So a a small slight, for example, breaking off an engagement uh, to someone means someone in traditional Albanian law, not actual law, but like tribal customary law means that someone is well within the rights of killing you in revenge. Um, okay. All right. Zero to 10. Yeah, this is something of a problem, uh, and it has been a problem up until modern times. Uh, because say, like, if you piss someone off, say, you, like, you break off an engagement with someone. Normally, it's something much worse than that, um, but you know, not always. And you die, like natural causes or whatever. The blood feud will pass on to your children. 
because like oh, they didn't oh, so get revenge on you. <laughs> so you're not so getting out get that revenge easily. On your kids. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, God. Yeah, they, from my understanding, there's been a, a lot of work done to to to, to stamp this shit out. Uh, and from my, and again, from my understanding, it's it's largely dead. Uh, but back in the, where King Zogu or King Zog the first is very very fucking real. Um, now, as king, as you would imagine, King Zog accrued one hell of a blood feud debt. Um, and He's just racking them up left and right. It was thought to be anywhere from 600 to 1,000 fucking people who, according to tradition, had all of the rights in the world to connect him to Allah's Wi-Fi. Um, and this resulted in at least 55 as attempted assassinations uh, at him, uh, though probably more. And then maybe someone got cold feet, but like at least 55. 55? He was yeah. only king for like a decade. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's a, that's a painful average. Um, he stopped going out in public, pretty much. His wife did all the public appearances. Um, but now, as the world was getting closer and closer to World War II and the Great Depression whooped everybody's ass, King Zog had a bit of a problem. Albania was fucking broke. I mean, they were broke before the Great Depression, but now they were really fucking broke. Well, it's, so, it's like there's a between being broke and being broke. <laughs> yeah, be, like literally like living in a, uh, wearing a barrel for clothes, but also king. Though, actually, I should point out, the, the royal family never suffered. Of course, they didn't. That's not how royalty works. Um, but thankfully for Zog, he had a good friend that would totally help him pay his debts. Benito Mussolini of Italy. <laughs> there we go. I was waiting for him. <laughs> he's, he's here. The, you, know, you, you know, things were tough for him. Things were tough for Albania. But luckily, he, he, had, he had something. I'm, I'm, I'm missing the word here. He had, um, he had a... Um, uh, what's the word for a friend like that? He had a. Hold me, hold me. <laughs> Thank you. Ah. Now, uh, now I'm just thinking of that uh, the Toy Story song. You got a friend in me, but it's Mussolini and Zog walking down the street together. <laughs> oh, that's the most they cursed cut in, mental you got a image. Friend in me. <laughs> you got a friend in me. <laughs> now. Um, Mussolini, of course, Mussolini wasn't friends with Albania. This is empire shit. He had been supporting Albania with year, for years, mainly to push British influence out of the region because the Brits are also leaking in, which is the only way Brits go everywhere is they leak in. Um, and like we talked about before, Mussolini dreamed of his own idiotic Roman Empire one day. And uh, that was we talked a lot more about that during the uh, Greco-Italian War. So if you want more insanity about uh, Mussolini's Roman Empire Part 2. Go listen to that. Um, but he included Albania within that. And after the Great Depression tore through Albania, Italy was financing so much of the government's budget that the Albanian National Bank's headquarters just fucking moved to Rome. <laughs> I remember this. <laughs> just, 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 just waking up one day, walking down the street in, in, in your, your bank, much like that one pizza place that used to be on the corner. It's just like, sorry, we've moved to a new location. It's like, yeah, you're the National Bank. That, that reminds me of like uh, during like the sick man of Europe phase of the Ottoman Empire, uh, like the the debt uh, management, uh, like administration put in place by the French in the Ottoman Empire uh, because they were giving so much money to the Ottoman Empire it was bigger than the Ministry of Treasury for the Ottoman Empire. It's like, the, oh see, man, there's empire shit and then there's this. You see, you see the, the new today, they would just, you know, hire McKinsey to do that. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, and they would also have worked for fascist Italy. <laughs> now, do not now look that Italy, at Pete Buttigieg's resume. Oh God! Now, effectively, uh, Italy owned the country, and Italy began making demands that the king put Italians in charge of virtually every branch of government, as well as the military. And oh yeah, by the way, teaching Italian is now mandatory in school. So at this point, they're just kind of doing the like, you know, we're we're going to make you an Italian territory in all but name before we do it formally. Yeah, until we eventually do it by force, which they're about to do. Now, that is when the main character of our story comes in. 40 minutes later, Leku Zogu was born April 7th, 1939. And two days later, Italy invaded. Uh, <laughs> wow, that is, a, that is a good omen to be born under. Now, this is the length of Leka's existence in Albania until he's an old man. Um, because the Albanian army was led by uh, Italians mostly, and it didn't really fight. 
at the time, and the royal fl- family simply fled into exile. When bombs began to fall on Albania, uh, Zog urged his people, quote, fight to the last drop of blood to defend our independence, all while he and his family ran to Greece. <laughs> oh, and bravely, for good he was measure, just bravely advancing in the wrong direction. <laughs> And for good measure, they looted the entire National Bank branch in Tirana and took all of the gold with them, which I think Lekka lived on it for his entire life. Uh, it was a lot crucially, of they had to. Crucially, they could only loot the branch because they had moved their National Bank to <laughs> Rome. Yeah, they could only loot the Tirana na- uh, branch of their own National Bank. Now, the family moved around constantly, seemingly never staying in one place very long. A lot of this was due to just regular paranoia. Um, Lekka apparently gained admission to Sandhurst Military Academy in the UK, where he graduated. Now, this has a huge asterisk next to it. I cannot find an original source on this fucking anywhere. Um, yeah, no, I, ever- I, I couldn't find anything about that either, because I went down this little rabbit hole when I, I inserted this slide uh, on him into the What Does Your Problem episode. And that's the problem with a lot of things about his life, is there's a lot of asterisks all over, or a lot of citation needed. but ostensibly he was in the British army, which isn't out of the question because this has happened with other sort of British friendly monarchs. Like the King of Jordan was briefly in the British army. Can you fact, the King of Jordan was technically on a training rotation, technically in the U S army for a while. Yeah. And I can't find anything other than people saying he was a Sandhurst graduate. I can't even find what unit he was in. If he was in the British military, um, it seems like it could be true, but it also seems like it could be bullshit. It could really go either way, and especially because the main source for this is Lekka Zogu, which he loves I him some s- him. Yeah, like I could easily see it being him lying, but I could also see it being he was there and everyone who knew him who was there would rather everyone forget that he was there. That sounds also possible because he loves military uniforms. So he got that love from somewhere, and I think it may have been Sandhurst. Um, but he was also fucking huge. Like the guy, you can't tell from pictures unless he's standing next to someone. Like he is almost seven feet tall. He 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 he's Joe sized. I no, I am only six four. This guy is You're six only eight. six four. Yeah, this guy is six eight and over three hundred pounds. Like he is fucking massive. Yeah, and I'm remembering now the pictures I've seen of him. Like, he, when you say, you know, when you think 300 pounds, this guy is not a fat man. He is a tall, broad man. He, he's a, we love a big guy. No, if you're, if you're seven foot tall and you're fat, you're probably way over 300 pounds. Because um, uh, your body just carries the weight differently. He's a big fucking guy. Um, but, you know, eventually Albania was liberated from the Italians and the Germans via a pretty chaotic group of partisans that tend to form. Whenever anybody invades someone else, that tends to happen. If you invade someone, you're, you're going to get a rainbow of ideologies who put aside their differences to shoot you in the face. Um, now, the most powerful of these groups is Enver Hoxha's National Liberation Movement, which is supported by the Soviet Union and Tito's Yugoslav Partisan Movement. Um, two sides that will totally never fucking turn out to hate one another in the future. Yeah. Now, and Hoxha was ever uh, happened. Nothing bad ever. Uh, yeah. Hoxha was uh, eventually elected head of the anti-fascist council of national liberation, because as leftists, we all know that the titles for everything have to be fucking incomprehensible. And after that, he made a uh, provisional government of Albania. Now we've talked a lot about Hoxha before, uh, but he was something of a chaotic whirlwind of different communist I- ideologies, starting somewhere around Stalinism and turning into Maoism at some point, and then simply calling himself a Hoxhaist. Uh, because neither of the two ideologies allowed him to build all those sweet bunkers he wanted so much. <laughs> it's 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 always great every so often on Twitter when when you see somewhere in your replies or follows you see someone who has hoches in their in their bio. Yeah, uh, all that means is that person wants like a niche. All that means is that person is fourteen years old and plays Hearts of Iron. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Ho- Hoxha, it was a if you if you took it's like mixing paint. If you took all of the ideologies that he followed during his time as leader of Albania, none of them match and none of them go together well at all. Um, but uh, it's, did- it's like mixing, of it's mixing the paint and then huffing it. Oh, well, yeah, of course. Um, I mean, I, the guy is probably one of my favorite weird off the fucking rails uh, uh, 
rulers that existed during this time period that nobody really ever talks about other than the bunkers because he did other wild ass shit too like insisting that his military actually just needed to be a a, a countrywide militia with no training <laughs> like uh, just yeah no, good he, like, stuff he's, all he's, oh he's more than just the bunkers folks he he's, oh, yeah. he's like an ogre he has onion he has layers yeah, yeah, I flood um, that <laughs> now uh, he did a lot of stuff. We talked about more on the Albanian Civil War episode. But one of the good things he did do was abolish the monarchy. Um, because hey. after Al- after Albanian liberation, King Zog still made it known that he claimed the throne of, of Albania. And uh, uh, and since the, uh, the fascists were gone, he should be able to take over again, despite the fact he himself actually never did anything to liberate his country. Um, also... Weirdly, nobody in the West actually recognized King Zog as the rightful leader, nor Hoaxha at this point in the late 1940s. However, by the late 40s, Albania was not doing so great. It was by far the poorest country in Europe, and multiple countries had designs on its borders to include Yugoslavia and Greece because Balkans. (laughs) Hoaxha had uh, not done a great job in uniting the country, and that was still outside of major uh, urban centers. It was very much rural, and they were very much used to ruling their own life. Uh, like it, Albania generally ran with the king ruling Tirana and a few larger cities, and everybody else doing whatever the fuck they wanted. It's kind of um, like be- kind of like what uh, Afghanistan was when they still had the king. Yeah, and that's how the king actually kept peace, is he didn't make those people do what he wanted. He's like, no, nah, actually, you guys are good. Fine, do whatever. Uh, and you know, uh, thankfully, that had a happy ending. Um, yep. Every, Afghanistan, another place on our list of places where things have famously gone very well. That's right. Now, in the middle of all this, and Hoaxha was really trying to clamp down this rural individualism because he's, he's a Stalinist at this point. Uh, right. The CIA showed up. <laughs> yeah. Now, their plan was to airdrop a bunch of fascists and people who vaguely supported King Zog to prop up this idiot king as a thorn in the side of the communist east, as well as scrap Soviet plans to build a submarine base off the Albanian coast. Now... If you're thinking that the CIA put a lot of thought into this, you'd be very wrong. <laughs> I mean, this was this was the CIA, in, and I, I won't say peak CIA brain because that's the '60s for me, '50s and '60s. Uh, but this this is a crapshoot. They this saw is also it. early CIA brain. Like this is like they're still like, and I'm guessing like this is what the the late '40s, early '50s at this point. Like, yeah, you know, was, yeah. So so they're they're still they're still hitting their stride. They're still figuring out what they're doing with their life. They're backpacking around Europe. Yeah, exactly. They're in their gap year before they start doing unfathomably evil shit. Yeah, um, they're in their gap year before Operation Ajax. Yeah. Now, the CIA thought this was going to be fucking easy because Albania looked like it was held together with like duct tape and, and spit at this point. And they thought it would be an easy domino to kick over in their anti-communist crusade that, you know, thankfully wouldn't lead to untold horrors behind our comprehension for decades to come. But it was also kind of perfect for their goals. The Soviets and Hoaxha hadn't started hating one another quite yet, but the CIA also knew that the Soviets didn't actually care that much about Albania. So, like, if people knew that the CIA was doing fucked up shit there, which, of course, people would know that quite quickly, the the Soviet Union wouldn't uh, get involved. They're like, ah, whatever, who cares? Um, It's also like, you know, when you look at a map, you know, at the time, you know, because Yugoslavia wasn't firmly... Never really, they never joined the Warsaw Pact, and even before the, the the split with Stalin and Tito, they weren't, you know, super cool with one another. And Albania is like physically separated from the rest of the Soviet sphere of influence. Like, there's no direct land route to there. Right, and the Soviet Union was never really great at deploying soldiers abroad uh, for any yeah. you know, continuous amount of time, unless it was over a direct land border. But exactly, the CIA kind of figured that yeah, we could probably pull this off. And they were going to create a new Albanian civil war to overthrow Hoxha. But then the operation had a lot of different names. One was Operation Valuable. The other was BG Fiend in all caps, like a supervillain group. But my personal favorite, Operation Obopus. <laughs> I have no what? idea what the fuck it means. <laughs> you ex- fucking excuse me? <laughs> operation <laughs> Obopus? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine I'm walking sorry. into a briefing room and set, like on a butcher board in front of you, just Operation Obopus as a go. <laughs> oh, oh, I, I, I know something that's going to be going in my my Twitter handle for a while now. <laughs> oh, there's so oh, many God. different ways you can think of Obopus. Is it is it an oboe with eight arms or whatever? Is it an oboe Like, what is it? <laughs> oh, God. 
I, I just, I, I, I was already kind of there with BJ Fiend or BJ, BG Fiend or whatever the hell that was, but that's already been obliterated in my head by Operation Opo Puss. <laughs> oh, oh, that, 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 uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm embodied by it. I'm, I'm destroyed. <laughs> When I read that, I minimized my screen, walked outside, and smoked a cigarette. I'm like, I'm I'm done with this for the day. I'm done. The CIA is just is is especially like the 1950s and 60s CIA. It, you know, if, if the things they didn't end up doing didn't cause like again, you know, man made horrors beyond their comprehension, it would be the funniest bullshit in the world. The things they tried to do, like killing, trying to kill Casco with like exploding cigars or something like that, or like putting poison in his scuba suit or whatever. Oh, yeah, you know, they they ne- well, you know what they never tried was to uh, fire a cannon uh, um, with a guy inside with a knife and and over from Florida into Cuba. They never they never see they they hired Bugs Bunny as a consultant with the exploding cigar, but they never hired Wiley e. Coyote. Which is unfortunate. Well, you see, Joe, it's not that they didn't do that. It's just that they probably haven't declassified it yet because the guy in the cannon might still be alive. The guy in the can is still circumnavigating the Earth. Uh, he 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 broke orbit and he's stuck there. <laughs> um, now, this is a, the uh, Operation Obopus, which I think we can all agree is what we're going to call this. Uh, yes. Was a shit show from the very beginning. Most of the dudes that the CIA and MI6, because of course they're involved, brought in for the operation actually did not want the king, and instead wanted their own semi-democratic provisional government in exile. Though I should put out here, what they did form as the Free Albanian National Committee was a 100% CIA-fronted spook group. Like, this is not an actual government exile. But this is all like the Albanian diaspora. They couldn't actually find anybody with Albania, within Albania that wanted anything to do with this movement. Uh, whether it be because Hoaxha was had been really good at killing his political enemies, which he was, or because people knew this was some spy shit and had no chance of succeeding when they I saw it. Big of an Albanian diaspora even was there because it's not like Albania is especially big. Um, at least two dozen people, at least because that's how many people they had. <laughs> there yeah. are literally dozens of us. <laughs> Instead, the Albanian uh, the Albanian diaspora was recruited and put through training in Malta of all places, and then their unit was nicknamed the Pixies for reasons I have not been able to find out. <laughs> this is the. the- this is all just a bit now. Op- the Pixies are going in to carry out Operation Obopus. <laughs> this is actually the origin story for the band The Pixies. Um, this is where the, this is actually not a lot of people know, but Operation Obopus is where we get the term Manic Pixie Dream Girl. Manic Pixie Albanian Dream Girl. Yeah, that, that they cut the Albanian part out because they they're uh, Albanian phobic. Um, <laughs> However, there was a small problem with this plan. And by small, I mean a problem with the entire plan. One of the main organizers of the entire thing was a British intelligence a- agent named Kim Philby. Now, a lot of people oh, here probably no. just fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> well, one, one, I was all no because, of course, the British are going to show up. I knew they were going to show up the moment you said Malta. And then you said Kim Philby. <laughs> Now, for people who are unaware, Kim Philby was a legendary double agent for the Soviet Union. So he fed all of the info of Operation Obopus to the Soviets, who then, of course, told Hoaxha that all these pixies are going to show up and try to blow stuff up. So as soon as the pixies landed in 1950, they got killed on the fucking spot. It was like it was like they got spawn camped in real life. <laughs> Operation the pixies got killed during Operation Obopus because Kim Philby told the Soviets this is the craziest sentence I've ever said. The Pixies get spawn camp during Operation Obopus is a sentence that only people who listen to this podcast will fucking understand. I go, love ahead and this show. The, uh, go ahead and enter that one into go ahead and enter that one into the lore catalog. Oh god. Now nobody knew that Philby was a mole, so they sent more teams in over the next couple of years and they all fucking died too. <laughs> oh, just sending in recurring waves of pixies for Operation Obopus 2, 3, 4. Guys, guys, I know Operation Obopus 4 failed, but I have, this real, I have a really, really good idea. Uh, I have a good feeling about Operation Obopus look, 6. Look, they didn't expect us to do Operations Obopus 1 through 11, so they won't expect us to do Operation Obopus 12. They just won't be expecting it this time. They wouldn't expect My us to do it a God, dozen times. My God, is that times. Luigi Cardona's music? <laughs> no. 
The CIA was so deeply embarrassed about this that it remained top secret until 2006. Uh, <laughs> I was about to say why I had – this is one of the few instances of CIA fuckery I'd never heard of and now it makes absolute sense because even compared to some of their other failures, this is an especially embarrassing failure. Yeah, it was pretty good. Now, oh, by the way, while all of this was still happening, Prince Wilhelm was still alive and claiming the throne. Nobody gives a fuck about him, though. <laughs> So so they have two monarchs claiming the throne that nobody gives a fuck about. Yes. Um, now, Hoaxa was a super paranoid weirdo, but like this C- o- Operation Obapus did him no favors in that front. So he believed as long as Prince Lekka and his dad were alive, someone would use them to try to coup him. He, did, he wasn't worried about Prince Wilhelm. He didn't give a fuck. Uh, so like any good despotic pariah state, Hoaxa eventually developed a brutal security apparatus. This is normally used internally, as you would imagine, but he also sent them abroad to hunt the Zogu royal family. Because of this, they eventually formed a small army of bodyguards. Weirdly, most of them were from Thailand. I cannot find a good reason as to why. Huh. Okay. okay. The, the, the hunt for the Zogus is on. The game is afoot. Yeah. Uh, though there was a fair amount of hardcore Albanian royalists who followed the family into exile or had been picked up from the diaspora. Though, again... I don't know why so many Thai people were in his ar- army of royal bodyguards. Maybe he was in tight with the Thai royal family or something. You know what? That's entirely possible. You know, it may very well have been. You know, that they they were one of the only they're one of the only monarchies that stuck around in Asia after the war. Oh, they're still there. Yeah, and if you yeah. go there and insult them, you will go to prison. That's oh, you weird. will go. You will be the most in prison you have yeah. ever been in your life. You'll be in so much prison. You'll be like, damn, how did I get in so much prison? Now, King Zog I, the only actual king of modern Albania, died in 1961, and the weird collection of royalists who'd been following the family around immediately pro- proclaimed Lekka as King Lekka I. And just to set the stage for you, this happened in the banquet room of a hotel, the same place that your Mima gets roped into pyramid schemes. Yeah, yeah like they, they had to... They had to have the ceremony done by by 1 p.m. because then the the guys have to start setting up for the wedding that evening. (laughs) Now, after this, Lekka continues to move around constantly because he was worried about an Albanian death squad that was sent out to kill him, which sounds wild, but it was a thing that absolutely existed. Yes. At one one point, he ended up in Thailand in the 1970s on a private plane. uh, And when he was going through customs, he figured he just wouldn't have to go through customs because he's king though not really. Uh, so when the Thai customs agents ma- searched his plane, they found it like nose to tail full of guns, rocket launchers, and grenades. And folks, if you're not aware, this is what we know as illegal. Um, it's also what we know as dude's rock behavior. There's 100% dude's rock behavior. Because like, why did he have them? I, like, That's why most people think that he actually ran out of money from his family and he was just an arms trafficker. Though nobody's been able to actually prove that for for certain, which actually means I don't buy that he was an arms trafficker because King Lekka or Prince Lekka, whoever, was not a bright man. If he was a like an arms trafficker, he would probably have all of his money in a bank account labeled arms trafficking proceeds. Yeah, like you gotta have some amount of. If you don't want to get caught, like, and he's like, again, he like, he he may ostensibly be a royal, but he doesn't have like any real pull or anything, like any sort of influence to avoid being arrested. So, if you want to be an arms trafficker and you don't have that kind of pull, you kind of have to have you know some intelligence and gravitas to be able to work the system, which this guy seems like he does not have. He mostly just got around on favors for his family. Uh, like the, he got arrested, and Thai authorities, I assume, slapped a giant boot device in his private jet. But like he was never kept in prison for very long. Not certainly not for this many weapons. And when he was released from prison, he moved to Franco's Spain, where Franco was in close with his dad, um, and he was allowed to live hassle free uh, under the government. Uh, under the only rule is that he kept his personal bodyguard uh, uh, to a minimum. And did not turn his house into an arms cache. He broke both I of these I feel like rules. you're... I was about to say, I feel like you're making these both really specific for a reason. <laughs> yeah. His Spanish estate hired anywhere from 50 to 150 mercenaries, building them all on the property where he stacked upon what it has to be conservatively hundreds of weapons. So um, he's just he's just chilling out in Spain on his estate, which with, with, with is basically a reinforced infantry company. Yes. 
um, in, a, in, 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 a, in a palatial barracks building, apparently. Spain's government, despite being, you know, fascist, was pretty sure he was attempting to build some kind of private army to try to invade Albania in some way. Like, like this is the this is what we can think of here that makes the most amount of sense. Um, but this is mostly because he also used to tell Franco, who he met personally a few times, that he really wanted to go and take over Albania by force and restore the crown. So. <laughs> Look, he, yeah. he saw he saw the Bay of Pigs invasion and thought that went really well. I'd like to try that. What if we did this in the mountains? Um, so uh, this ended up being a little bit too much for uh, for Franco, and he was told to stop being fucking weird, pack it up, and get the fuck out of Spain. And uh, he he in 1979 he did after two years. Uh, and the 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 reason why he was officially expelled was for quote supporting irredentist activities, which is. I don't even know how badly you have to fuck up to get kicked out of Spain when you're a close personal friend of the dictator, but he managed. Yeah, like you have to do – when you're a weird right-wing shithead monarch, you have to do a lot of shit to get kicked out of Franco-era Spain. Yeah. Yeah, I mean credit where credit's due in all honesty. Um, but from here, uh, he decided there's only one place left to go for a fascist supporting communist hating private army owning arms smuggling due to the private plane Rhodesia of oh, here we are we arrive though while on his way to Rhodesia his plane had to make a refueling stop in Gabon or Gabon uh, I think it's Gabon Gabon let's go with Gabon as his plane landed and uh, got hooked up to a fuel truck dozens of armed men rode onto the airship in the back of pickup trucks and gunned straight for Lekka's jet now, Lekka ordered the pl- pilot to take off, knowing that these guys weren't there to kill him. They'd probably been hired by Hoaxia to capture him and, and bring him back to Albania. So as the jet began to taxi on the runway, Lekka kicked open that side door and hung out the side with a fucking RPG in his hands and pointed it at the truck. This like is just a GTA cod level now. shit. Yeah. This is this literally is- just a Call of Duty level. Yeah. Seeing that this guy was clearly nuts or not wanting to be the only truck ever who's been clapped by a drive-by shooting committed by a king of Albania off the side of a personal jet, the gunman backed off. Oh, my God. It's often said that Lekka was invited by the Rhodesian government, but he was not. Even noted fuckwit Ian Smith was not the biggest fan of this guy. However, when you're a shitty racist apartheid state, you generally don't turn help help when it shows up on its own in a private plane packed to the gills with guns and eager anti-communist volunteers to join your ongoing civil war. Yeah. And, and, and this is what I'm guessing by now, this is what the, the mid to late seventies, but what point the Rhodesians yeah, just were about. really getting desperate. So they were just taking anything that they could get. It wasn't going great. Uh, uh about the volunteers. Lekka told Ian Smith that his Royal guard would gladly fight for the cause of Rhodesia in exchange for Rhodesia. Once victorious in their ongoing race war, supported his goal of conquering Albania and restoring his throne. Now, Ian Smith took one look at this guy and his plan and said, nope. (laughs) Which, imagine being so insane that Ian Smith of Rhodesia decides that you have gone too far with your political goals. The one one good decision the man ever made in his life. (laughs) Yeah. Um, You don't have to hand it to him, but he did do that one thing once. Um, (laughs) Though this I wish what actually, he had done is actually die when he crashed his hurricane into the desert in Egypt. <laughs> Alternative history. Now, one thing, like, like the, this didn't stop Lekka from full-throatedly supporting Rhodesia. Somehow he even got his royal guard and himself Rhodesian brush, brushstroke uniforms, famously, because he, wear it all, he wore it all the time. And he got stitched up with the Kingdom of Albania's flag on his shoulders and not uh, Hoaxia's Albania, which was their two different flags. Um, you can you can find this on the internet. There there's pictures of uh, his his royal guard in the 70s in Al- in Rhodesia with those uniforms, with the patches, with the AKs, with the baby poop camo on them. It's yeah, it's, he, it's he wore the uniform all the time too. Oh, um, yeah. And he, he found a uniform for himself, named himself the commander of the guard. Uh, though he claimed his men were all going to go fight for Rhodesia, um, and he was going to lead them. They didn't really. Um, there's no evidence that any of the Albanians actually fought. Um, there are a few photos, like you mentioned, of the Royal Guard in Rhodesian uniforms and Albanian flags, but that's it. And in yeah. those pictures, they're carrying Rhodesian camouflage AKs rather than the infamous FNFAL. 
Um, and they're not wearing any equipment. They're just wearing a uniform. It seems it's like totally they're, just like a, they're doing it for just for show. It really seems like the government just gave them some clothes. Um, according to the book Fighting and Writing, the Rhodesian Army at War and Post War, the Albanians just played dress up for Lekka as the Rhodesian government didn't want to train them because he was because mo- like not because they didn't need the men. Rhodesia certainly did. It's because if we train these guys, they're going to go fight in Albania afterwards. and This is going to cause a problem for us. Again, imagine being so fucking weird that Rhodesia does not want you to fight for them. Yeah, and, and Rhodesia had some weird ass people fighting for them. In, in, whole lot of Nazis. Including a whole lot of Nazis, specifically a whole lot of American Nazis, including one that Joe got a lister of this show in Zimbabwe to piss on the grave of. Still my proudest achievement, yeah. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, that guy is still buried there. Uh, it's unfortunate for Zimbabweans. Well, you know what? I just, you know what I call that? I just call that, you know, uh, opportunities for, for more pissing. That's right. Now, uh, this actually would make sense that none of this ever happened uh, for real because Lekka wanted to train an entire battalion. Um, and he only had like 10 guys. Yeah, like for, for reference, for those who don't know, a battalion, like an infantry battalion, at least the US Army is what, like 800 to 1,000 guys sometimes? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he had about, I'll, get, I'll be charitable to him as he had a dozen people. Um, yeah, he, he was like an international like uh, problem guy. Nobody wanted to deal with him. Uh, but Lekka kept playing dress up with his men in a compound in Rhodesia. I assume living like a king because he was never any short of money. All the way up until Robert Mugabe took power in 1980, at which point he ran to where a lot of other people from Rhodesia ran to in order to keep up their very cursed and fucked up lifestyle, apartheid South Africa, where he was invited there as a guest of the government. He's... <laughs> So he wasn't invited to Rhodesia, a country that didn't even have like any recognition and in itself was an international pariah, but South Africa, a country that despite everything still had international recognition and was still more connected to the world despite being just as shitty, was like, yeah, come on in. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, he was given a <laughs> massive farm near Johannesburg uh, and given official diplomatic status by the government, which was fiercely anti-communist, which meant that put them directly at odds with Hoaxia. So, of course, they're going to welcome him. And, you know. and that just makes a question. Why did he just go to South Africa first? Uh, I mean, it's Lekka. So he went to the most fucked up country first. And then when they yeah, lost, you know what? Second. You know what? That's yeah, that, 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 that tracks. He, he had to go to the most fucked up one first. And then once Rhodesia was knocked off the list, then he could go next door. Yeah. He, once again, he was allowed to take his royal guard, all of whom are still wearing Rhodesian uniforms, uh, as well as a small stockpile of guns where they all just kind of hung out for a little while. Though he did have a son who he, of course, proclaimed prince uh, as he was uh, still claiming to be king. At the time of his birth on 26th of March, 1982, the South African government declared his maternity ward where his son was born temporarily Albanian territory to ensure that his son, Lekka, also named Lekka, was born on Albanian soil and therefore his claim to the Albanian throne would still be valid. I assume this is a made up law. Uh, this has actually happened with uh, like uh, exiled monarchs quite frequently. Uh, like their ki- like their maternity ward has declared the, this kind of soil because some of them have rules that you have to be born in the country to be able to assume the throne. I found like three other occasions of something like this happened. Well, it's easy to push through a law or whatever change to do that when you know only a small minority of your country's population can vote in a sham parliament anyway. Yeah. Um, now his son's name is interesting. Um, Lekka Anwar Zog Reza Badun Mizwehu Zogu. Now, what? <laughs> yeah, uh, Anwar was for Anwar Sadat, dictator of Egypt. I have no idea why, okay. as the two have never met. Uh, Zog and, was for and his he wasn't grandfather. A king. <laughs> and he was not a king. Yeah. Uh, Zog was, of course, for his grandfather, even though that was not his actual name. Reza is for the Shah of Iran. Uh, uh, Badun is the king of the Belgians, and the and the last one is a random Zulu word that Lekka absolutely had no idea the meaning of. The thing, honestly, though, out of all of those, the one that still gets me the most is is Sadat because you think like because I'm pretty sure he even stayed with the king of Egypt at some point. So I guess it just goes to show that absolutely nobody wants anything to do with King Farouk anymore. Yeah, <laughs> poor poor King Farouk. Um, poor King now, Farouk and his largest collection of pornography ever. We respect that. That's an episode right there. (laughs) Uh, Now, eventually things began getting hot in South Africa for them as the apartheid was slowly and surely beginning to fall under immense pressure. 
Uh, also, the Hoxha system in place in Albania also began to fail as well. Hoxha had died in 1985, and the system he created, well, it didn't ever really work, but it definitely could not keep working as it hadn't been working without him. And by not working, I mean uh, slowly slugging along and 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 keeping it. It's like what happened with to together. Yugoslavia after Tito. Like basically, it was right. him that kept the country together. You know. Not just because, you know, like all those countries, there were obviously like police state rules in, fit in place, though they were more lax than others, but also because people genuinely liked Tito. Now, with Hoka, I imagine that that like was not as universal. No, it was mostly terror. Um, yes. I mean, and, and but he was the only one that could make the country work the way that he had built it because remember, he's the only leader that they had since the king. It was built for purpose, and that purpose was yeah. for him to run it. <laughs> yes, that's 100% correct. Um, and the people that took over uh, were realizing a lot of the problems that Hoxha was papering over for decades. And reforms were attempted, but uh, they still weren't going well. This led to a lot of reformers to keep trying to, to keep uh, most of what made up the Socialist People's Republic of Albania in place, but stability was not something anybody could f- quite figure out. And that is where Lekka reappeared. Well, appear really, because he had. This is the first time he attempted to go to Albania ever since he was born, uh, and and then exiled two days later. Either way, he thought that when he showed up, because of all of the chaos and instability, people would swarm the streets and greet his return and usher him back onto the throne. Which I should point out that he still believed this to be an absolute monarchy, despite the fact it was now 1993. <laughs> And he's been hiding out in Rhodesia and South Africa and Francoist Spain. Yeah, he's truly preaching to the heart of the common Albanian with that. Now, so he landed in Tirana, though small problem. He didn't have a passport, not a real one. So he had a fake royal government passport uh, made for him with the official job title on the inside as king. He, he, he just he just did the papers please thing. That little guy in papers please who the game some people might know where this is one guy who just keeps trying to sneak in with various badly made passports. <laughs> <laughs> he just he's just literally putting like his his made up passport on the thing. He's like, yes, I am from Cobrastan. It is a very <laughs> nice country. Uh, yeah, he was refused entry. Um, so he went back to his compound in South Africa where he. He learned times had uh, had changed. Without the official government uh, protection of the apartheid government of uh, of, of South Africa, he was quickly arrested on weapon smuggling charges on account that he was still carrying a massive stockpile with him wherever he went. Um, Then in 1997, as we've talked about before on the show, the Albanian economy imploded under the weight of the entire economy based around pyramid schemes and corruption. I invite you to go listen to that episode. Um, So once again, with this happening and the civil war beginning to brew up, Lekka saw another perfect time for him to ride back into Albania. And just to just to frame this, it makes a little bit more sense. Yugoslavia had exploded into war at this point. And Lekka had been preaching about gr- a greater Albanian state, much like uh, oh, many go. YouTube comment sections do to this day. Um, while nobody gave a single fuck about him in 1993, by 1997, he was popular as hell, especially in the, like, the same place that his dad was from. And this time, he really was greeted by cheering crowds. He was so there popular. There are all sorts of pictures of this. Yeah, it's really wild. Um, and he was so popular by by the time that year's parliamentary election came around, they also held a referendum about the restoration of the monarchy, which would have officially made King Lekka the first king of Albania. It lost, and it lost by a lot. Um, lost by a lot. I, I think he did. He did claim that you know that it might have been rigged. To which I say, on one hand. You know, given the state Albania was in the mid '90s, that's not entirely out of the question. On the other hand, don't give a shit. Be mad about it. Yeah, exactly. Now, according to Albania, over 65 percent of the people voted against the return of the monarchy. Uh, so, of course, Leka insisted that the vote was rigged, leading to a recount where he still lost. <laughs> On uh, the 3rd of July, 1997, while dressed in his Rhodesian military uniform and armed with a grenade and a pistol strapped to his leg, he greeted around 2,000 supporters in Tirana to chants of, quote, Albanians will defend their vote. Down with the communists. We want a king. Um, so he crowd, tried to do a little coup. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the crowd led by Lekka marched on the capital central boulevard as bursts of gunfire ripped into the crowd. Nobody's entirely sure of who fired first whether it be the government or the crowd, who were, everybody was armed to the teeth. But in the end, one guy was dead and several people were injured. And thus, 
died his attempt to make Albania a kingdom once more. Though he still refused to accept the results of the vote, uh, but uh, was now forced to flee the country uh, as his weird ro- royal LARPing had actually killed a guy and he had to go back to South Africa. Um, because they he let him got- back in? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, even though, like, because he was actually given some amount of courtesy by the Albanian government and instead of just being arrested, like, they sent him uh, a letter in the mail, like, could you please come to court on this particular day from the prosecutor? <laughs> and so he went to South Africa. He was eventually oh, sentenced to a whole three years in prison for attempting a coup, uh, though since he never returned, he never served it, um, though he was pardoned in 2002 uh, after pressure from parliament, uh, because there's, there's a lot of weird, um, in, this, uh, in the 2000 time frame, there's a lot of weird, sudden warm feelings about the, 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 the nobility, and I think a lot of it has to do with the, their government was bad. So people like, I feel well, like what? every country that was once a monarchy periodically when times are bad goes to that period of where you have like, you know, a small but significant minority saying maybe we should go back to the monarchy because rose colored glasses. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And that's almost probably almost certainly maybe his people just liked him because he was nuts and he was funny. I don't fucking know. Yeah. You know, we, um, we, I mean, hey, we love a crazy big guy. Why shouldn't they? Yeah, yeah exactly. And uh, he returned after he was pardoned, uh, bring with him 11 cases of automatic weapons, grenades, and hunting rifles. My man never changes. <laughs> He's though, nothing but consistent. Yeah. Uh, though uh, he, these were all immediately confiscated upon arrival. Um, an account of, no, you can't have these. But he wasn't arrested. Um, uh, there was like uh, the Albanian customs agents giving him the, giving him the, old, the old, oh, you, you know? <laughs> That crazy Lekka with all his yeah. firearms. Uh, and he, he lived in Albania the rest of his life, uh, doing pretty much nothing other than supporting a local monarchist political party uh, that did not do anything, really. Uh, he did not even give a shit about this party. When he was asked uh, like who he would vote for, he pointed out he had never voted, nor would he ever intend to vote. He said, quote, I'm above all other political parties, even my own. <laughs> well, he was trying to do the whole... Elizabethan thing of like, oh, I'm so politically, you know, neutral and not involved at all. You know, that only really works when everybody adores you and you're already in power. Yeah. And he was never in power and nobody ever adored him. So weird flex, buddy. Um, Lekka died in 2011 of a heart attack. And despite Albania never reinstating the monarchy to this day, uh, even in, 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 in a constitutional role, because remember, he wanted to be an absolute monarch. That's what his vote was about. Um, he was given a state funeral and was buried at the Royal Mausoleum, which I assume only ever included his dad. Um, <laughs> I wonder if they even buried his dad there, <laughs> like because his dad didn't die in Albania. Maybe, so I wonder maybe if not. Yeah, I don't I wonder know. if they built one just for this guy. <laughs> the Royal Mausoleum, starring Lekka. Um, I don't know. It's it's quite possible. His son still claims the title of prince, which nobody recognizes, though his son actually has held significantly more power than his dad ever did. Um, he, uh, he was the advisor to the president for a while. He's incredibly popular as just a person. And while he, ne- he was never nominated, um, like uh, he was never nominated for president or to stand for president, he, he was like, it, it was an idea that people brought up because he was so powerful uh, or he's so popular, rather. Um, and from my understanding, he's still doing that. Uh, that's where he still is. Um, but yeah, uh, he's not a prince. Um, he's still, but that's weird. Like legally they have no monarchy, but people kind of give him the respect that they think he deserves. It's kind of weird. Um, but good, good for you, bud. You know, yeah, good, yeah, good, good for you. I mean, like good that you get people to do that, but like, that's, it's, that's, that's the thing with weird monarchist exiles or like, like monarchies that are no longer in power that people still pay them that like yeah it's like the fact that there's still napoleons running around europe yeah yeah i mean oh, there's for every old dead throne somewhere there is probably 10 people who all claim to run it which is awesome i think they should all be locked into a room and the last one to walk out gets the throne yeah we should just we should just take all the the sort of monarchist remnants in europe that like no longer have thrones but i'll claim it Put them all in like a, a Thunderdome type situation, and whoever lives just gets to be Emperor of Europe. Yeah, but with no power. It's like being the no prime power. minister. Yeah, it's like being a minister of parliament in the EU or something. Exactly. But they get the really nice, like, you know, hat. It'll be great. 
yeah, give him a sash. Fuck it. Um, now, KD, thank you so much for joining me today. We do this thing on the podcast called Questions from the Legion. If you'd like to ask oh, yes. this question from the Legion, you're supporting the show already. This is a bonus episode. You could just write us on Patreon and ask us a question. Um, and uh, we will answer on the show. Uh, today is... is um, actually, I, I read this earlier as I was going to the store to buy my my two individual beers, since that's how beer is sold here. Uh, <laughs> And uh, it, it's something that speaks to me in my heart. What is something unimportant that is annoying you at this moment? Um, oh, and that, that is change. Um, not like things changing, but physical coins for, for currency. Armenia <laughs> fucking loves coins. I get so many of them whenever you buy. And there's, there's no good way to carry them. You can't put them in a wallet. Where do you, where do you, do you, put, do you just carry a grip full of loose coins in your pocket wherever you're going? ridiculous can't stand it <laughs> see it's something completely unimportant and it's bothering the shit of me at the moment we're just doing old man talk now that's what we're doing i'm i'm doing like the the old millennial man talk i guess because like an old man would be like coins are good because you can buy things with them and when you piss when someone pisses you off you can flick one at them um or or something you, you gotta know? make like, sure to carry a roll of pennies in your fist <laughs> when you punch someone that way you put a little extra oomph behind it right like I don't know, take debit cards. Like, why, why, why won't you just take a debit card? And it's like, I understand I live in a, in a little bit of a different country, but like they accept debit cards here. My corner store, cash only. Like, come, come the fuck on. A- anyway, your turn. Oh, God. I, if people want to know what unimportant things are bothering me, they can just take a look at my Twitter account. Uh, that's that's but likewise, I mean, yeah. But if, if something physical, I guess like I'm, I'm just trying to figure out like the best way to get ikea to deliver a piece of like furniture to where i live that conforms to the weird hoa rules about how and where deliveries are taken and it's driving me up a goddamn wall it, it's like it, it's it's just i just want to be able to put together my flumphy or whatever the fuck it's called but it just <laughs> get like like oh god it, it's just get, getting things Getting things delivered it, it shouldn't be this much of a hassle, especially if they want us to use cars and things us to go pick it up ourselves. If you want us to get things to li- nothing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I think I hit I, on that. I think I got there. I, I fully understand what you mean. Uh, I, I, my, I live on the the sixth floor, and um, like my elevator is very, very small. Uh, you can't fit furniture into that thing. Maybe a, uh, maybe a fucking uh, like a end table or something. Like we have so a freight like, elevator, but the thing is, like, you got to reserve it. But then the thing oh, is, like, yeah. you in order to the like, IKEA doesn't let you reserve delivery times. They give you a window like the night before when it's going to show up. So now I'm trying to figure out, like, hey, can I just get this delivered to the front desk? And then, like, you know, I don't, you know, I don't want to. I have to live here. I don't want to have to piss off the people who work at the front desk. I want to keep them on my good side. So I'm just trying to figure out how to circumnavigate this whole medley of weird bullshit of just trying to get some a piece of IKEA furniture delivered. You simply hire a guy to throw it through your window. You gotta hire you know a what? big if he, guy. He's a big guy, you gotta get a, we gotta get Lika here. And what he'll do is he'll do like the Team Fortress Two thing of firing his RPG at the ground so he can you know uh, propel with the explosion the 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 table up through my window and, and the smoking remnants into my living room. Oh well, yeah, that's just science. Yeah, science. Um, it's Katie, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh we can end this with your plug for for your war takes. Oh, yeah, certainly. So I I I most of you probably know I I rant about war on stuff on Twitter at, at war underscore takes at the twitter.com. Uh, and you know, if you just want to hear me randomly ramble about whatever furry shit, you can also find me at, at Komodo dad on the twitter.com. Thank you so much for joining us today. Everybody else. Thank you for supporting the show. Um, uh, if you like what we do here, leave a review, tell us what you think. And until next time, if you have a personal plane, load it full of weapons and go to a country of your choosing. Yes.